I'm Forrest Brown, a writer and lover of stories, and you're listening to Stories for Earth. Welcome to Stories for Earth, a podcast about stories that can give us strength and resiliency in fighting the climate crisis. This is our first ever episode, and I'm so glad that you're out there listening, whoever and wherever you are. Today, we're already experiencing the effects of our climate's destruction, and now that we're past the point of completely averting the climate crisis, I think we should be turning our attention to how we can emotionally prepare ourselves for the challenges and hardships that are coming our way. We should, of course, also work on reversing the damage we're doing to our environment, but we can't ignore the emotional and psychological aspect of this work either. Personally, I've been depressed, anxious, and hopeless about this situation, and I know others, perhaps even you, feel or have felt this way too. This is something called climate grief, and it's a very real thing. I've been doing some research on this, and I think we aren't talking about it enough. In the book, Emotional Resiliency in the Era of Climate Change by psychologist Leslie Davenport, the author notes that suicide and depression rates skyrocket after natural disasters, disasters that will become more intense and common as the climate crisis worsens. I've heard the Swedish activist Greta Thunberg talk about getting extremely depressed when learning about the climate crisis. In fact, a lot of activists and scientists who work in this field often suffer from a kind of pre-traumatic stress disorder which is a condition in which a moderate level of stress and dread about the future gradually wears them down. As more and more everyday people such as myself become more aware of this crisis, they too will suffer from such conditions. So, what does all of this have to do with stories? I think quite a lot, actually. Stories are the lens through which we see the world. We use stories to translate chaos into sense and meaning. I am a reader and a writer, not a psychologist or any other kind of licensed health professional. But I think stories can help us here, like they do in so many other parts of life, and many academics and doctors agree. A German environmental and cultural sociologist named Annika Arnold wrote a book called Climate Change and Storytelling that focuses on how stories and various narratives can help us fight the climate crisis. In the introduction, Annika says, As storytelling animals, we perceive facts, numbers, and urgent appeals that surround climate change inherently as a story. She goes on to say, In order to make the fight against climate change a priority, climate advocates need to tell stories to mobilize people and guide their actions. So, that's exactly what I hope this podcast will be. A place where we can talk about stories that can help to mobilize us and guide our actions and thinking. We'll focus a little less on the specific actions part and more on the thinking emotional part. We'll talk about stories from authors who also grappled with issues like the climate crisis, natural disaster, persecution and hardship, rapid change, and more. These won't just come from books. I think any kind of story told through any kind of medium can be powerful. So we'll also look at movies, TV shows, video games, and who knows what else. So... Now that you hopefully have a firmer understanding of what this podcast is all about, and we've finished our sort of first day of school syllabus reading and personal introductions, let's get on to the story for our first episode, Parable of the Sower by Octavia E. Butler. I was first introduced to Octavia Butler as a freshman in college when her book Kindred was assigned as reading for an introductory class I took. I didn't appreciate her at the time, but since then I've become a big fan of hers, especially after reading her near-future dystopian novel Parable of the Sower. Octavia Butler was born Octavia Estelle Butler in Pasadena, California on June 22, 1947. She was an only child, and she grew up poor. Despite this, she went on to earn an Associates of Arts degree from Pasadena Community College, and then she studied at Cal State in Los Angeles before going on to UCLA. After college, she attended the Clarion Science Fiction Writers Workshop, which is a prestigious training ground for many aspiring science fiction and fantasy writers. 
Butler started writing as a young child, around the age of 8 or 10 years old, um, and she went on to win the Hugo Award, a Nebula Award, and a MacArthur Foundation Fellowship, which on the Charlie Rose Show, she refused to call a MacArthur Genius Grant, saying that if they really did hand those awards out to geniuses, she surely would not have won the award. After her death, she was also awarded the Penn American Center Lifetime Achievement Award in writing. Today, we remember her as the first black female science fiction writer to rise to prominence. Uh, Octavia said of herself, this was a quote that she wrote, um, I found it inside of the front cover of Parable of the Sower. She said, who am I? I'm a 47-year-old writer who can remember being a 10-year-old writer and who expects someday to be an 80-year-old writer. I'm comfortably asocial, a hermit, a pessimist if I'm not careful, a feminist, a black, a former Baptist, an oil and water combination of ambition, laziness, insecurity, certainty, and drive. Unfortunately, um, Octavia Butler died a few years ago outside of her home near Seattle, Washington, of a stroke at the age of 58. So on the surface, Parable of the Sower is a book about the collapse of the United States, but really it's a book about climate change. And while that is a huge part of the story, it's almost just kind of lurking in the background. I would say more than anything, the book is really about what humans are able to accomplish when they set their sights on something greater than themselves. The book is set in the near future, the near future at the time of the book's publishing to us not so far away now. Uh, it's set in the mid 2020s in a dystopian world that's been wrecked by climate change. In this world, the U.S. federal government has lost much of its control. Uh, state borders are closed off the same way that national borders are today. And gangs of dangerous drug dealers rape and pillage towns and communities across the country. The hungry, desperate, and homeless steal and kill to survive. And a gang of people addicted to a drug called pyro, which is a hallucinogen that drastically enhances a user's high when looking at fire, attack communities to steal dr money for drugs before burning everything to the ground. Our, hero our heroine excuse me, is Lauren Olamina, a black girl growing up in Robledo, California, which is a walled community outside of Los Angeles, though walled for necessity, not because they were wealthy. Uh, Lauren is a daughter of a Baptist preacher and a college professor, and she keeps a journal which constitutes the book. In this journal, she describes her life experience and also a religion she says she discovered, which she calls Earthseed. Another really interesting thing about Lauren is that she was born with a birth defect called hyperempathy. This was caused by an intelligence-enhancing drug her mom was taking during pregnancy. Hyperempathy forces her to share in the feelings of others, the good and the bad, uh, though as you might imagine in the world that Lauren is growing up in, it's mostly just a lot of bad feelings. We'll talk more about Earthseed, Lauren's religion, in just a moment, but for now there are two main takeaways you need to know about the religion. These are the two main tenets of Earthseed. Number one is God is change, and number two, the destiny of humanity is to take root among the stars. The story of Parable of the Sower is really the story as recorded by Lauren Olamina, and every entry begins with a, a verse of Earth Seed before jumping into accounts of Lauren's experience living in a world that's reeling from the devastating effects of climate change. Uh, these effects include massive wealth inequality, homelessness, lack of water, decreased access to education, um, epidemics of drug of drug addiction, refugee crises, um, and also a rise of far-right nationalist politics and Christian fundamentalist extremism. Uh, we'll talk more about that in our second episode um, on the sequel to this book, which is called Parable of the Talents. So Lauren grows up in a walled community in Robledo, California, when one day her community is destroyed by pyro addicts. They manage to break down the gate and basically just attack her community and burn it to the ground. Lauren manages to escape along with two other survivors from her community, and together they start walking north. Um, Lauren has it in her mind that she wants to go to either Washington State or Canada, where she's heard that things are supposed to be better. Along the way, uh, the three of them run into other travelers who join their party, including a former physician from San Diego named Binkhole who winds up taking them to a large plot of land he owns in a safer part of Northern California. 
Lauren's journal chronicles their perilous journey to Bankle's land, where they settle and establish the first community of Earthseed. In terms of themes, there's a lot going on in this book, and reading it at the time of this recording seems kind of surreal, to be honest. It's incredibly eerie how prophetic this book is in so many different ways. A good example, um, the book talks about rampant crony capitalism with giant tech firms who bring back slavery via, via indentured servitude, pretty much. There's also a rise of racism, hate crimes, and nationalism. There are massive refugee crises um, of people being driven not only up from Central America and Mexico to the United States, but also of people being driven from the United States up to Canada and to Alaska, which, spoiler alert, as we'll see in the next book, actually becomes its own sovereign state. It, um secedes from the Union for the first time since the Civil War. And then last but not least, there's also obviously unmitigated climate change, which Butler does an incredible job of presenting as an intersectional issue, especially considering this book was published in 1993, which was 26 years ago um, at the time of this recording in 2019. There's a really great, a great quote from the book that really sums this all up. Um, Lauren writes, people have changed the climate of the world now they're waiting for the old days to come back. So climate breakdown is a central issue in the book that basically sends the world back to the Dark Ages, the Middle Ages. Um, and I think that the way Butler chose to grapple with this issue as an intersectional one is brilliant. There are four main ways in which I think she does this. Number one is Lauren's hyper-empathy. At first, when I was reading through this book, I thought hyper-empathy would just be a purely net positive thing. Um, surely in such a violent time where there's so much uncertainty and just like massive social upheaval, um, being able to empathize uh, just on a crazy level with other people would surely be a good thing. It would surely, you know, instill some kind of kindness and maybe uh, help the world to try to put itself back together. But I hadn't considered how it could also be a crippling thing and even dangerous at times, especially when Lauren is having to defend herself and her party from, you know, pyro addicts or thieves or what have you. Um, for example, if she shoots someone and she sees it happen, she feels the gunshot wound. And as you can imagine, that's debilitating. But overall, um, Octavia Butler uses hyper empathy to save Lauren and her party for the very reason that I first described, it forces Lauren to see other people as human beings with real feelings that are just as important as her own. Um, this causes her to be compassionate towards other people. And in a world that's devolved even further into every man for himself, uh, this helps Lauren to find strength in numbers to grow her party by basically taking in people from the road. So hyper empathy may be fictional, but it does force us to consider how we would treat other people if we always felt everything that they are feeling. So as more people become victims of natural disasters and the emotional, psychological effects of climate change, I think we can benefit a good deal from thinking about um, Lauren's hyper-empathy and then applying that to our own lives of thinking of how we can empathize more with others and then turn that empathy into compassion. Theme number two is... Resiliency and Embracing Change. Earth Seed, which is the set of essential truths Lauren believes she's discovered, repeatedly emphasizes one thing. God is change. So change is the only constant. It's an unstoppable force as far as Lauren is concerned. And you really only have two responses to this. You can either choose to be terrified and just paralyzed, or you can uh, be nostalgic and long for the good old days and try to fight against change, like go back to the way things were before. Um, but as Lauren notes, this is only going to see you barreled over by change. So instead of resisting change, uh, people should learn to accept it and bend with it to sort of go with the flow. And in this way, the best human response to change is resiliency. And this is something we see in nature all the time. There is greater strength in pliability than in rigidity. And I think this applies really well to what we're talking about here. We hear the word change and climate change all the time, but I'm not convinced we always stop to consider all the ways in which a changing climate requires us to change as well. 
So we may have to change the way that we vote, uh, the way that we consume products, the way that we get around our transportation, and also how we transport and store goods. So I'm not saying it's going to be easy to make these changes for the characters in the book. The changes they have to make certainly aren't easy. Um, I don't think it's going to be easy for us either. Um, But we're much better off for adapting to our changing world than digging in our heels and fighting battle that we're sure to lose. The third theme is taking action as opposed to staying complacent. Here's a quote from a verse of Earthseed. It goes, All that you touch, you change. All that you change, changes you. The only lasting truth is change. God is change. So what Lauren is saying here is, as we're changed, we also affect change. I think this is illustrated best through an example, a thought experiment. So if you think about water that's coming from a melting glacier, it runs down the rocks over the centuries. It's going to take rivers and streams. But the way that the land gives to that water determines the path that the water will eventually take which in turn influences a lot of things. It forges the climate, uh, the geography, and leads way to entire ecosystems. So the best response to a change as colossal as climate change, then, is taking action. Climate change is going to make huge changes to the way we live, just like I mentioned, but we're not powerless to this. Every action we take also creates change, all of which adds up. And I think I struggled with this a little bit because when reading about the book, Octavia Butler said that Earthseed was, um, it's really kind of the culmination of a lot of religions that she studied to write the book, some of which include Buddhism, Taoism, and other Eastern religions. Um, And I think a lot of Western readers, when they're first introduced to these religions, um, mistake resiliency for complacency or for just being passive or being like a pushover or something like that. But really, that's not what it's saying. And I think that the way that Octavia Butler addresses this is really good. She takes special care to emphasize parts of these traditions that are often lost on us Western readers, especially parts about action or lack thereof. Uh, She sums this up in a verse from Earthseed. It says, Why is the universe? To shape God. Why is God? To shape the universe. So this isn't necessarily saying to dig in your heels and resist change like we were saying, but in going with change, we can also um, make a different set of decisions in that situation that will in turn impact the change we're going through. The verse I just read is um, acknowledged as essential paradox of earth seed, and it's the opposite of being complacent, weak, submissive, and demure. Instead, it centers on being strong-willed, on taking action, on riding the wave of change, but also directing it as you're able to uh, to suit your desires. And for Lauren, this meant seeking a better life and always being prepared. But for us today, it could be any number of things. Just like we talked about, voting for elected officials with plans for fighting climate change, making responsible consumer choices, planting trees and protesting inaction from our governments and corporations peacefully. The fourth and final theme is strength in numbers. Climate change is the biggest threat facing humanity today, and it's going to take as many people as possible to stop it and reverse it. This means people in every sector, in every industry, we all have an invaluable role to play in reversing climate change. This includes people who work in energy production and the arts, people who work in business, agriculture, and construction. This book does nothing else. I think it demonstrates that everything is delicately and inextricably intertwined, and that even the most seemingly insignificant changes have palpable effects that extend across the entire world. I remember I was listening to a really good podcast about climate change recently called Climate One, and a guy who is a climate writer for Vox was on the show, And I remember he said something that I thought was really good. He said people often will come to him and say, climate change is this massive, huge issue, and I am only one person. Like, what can I possibly do to fight climate change that will make any meaningful difference? And he had a really good response that I thought. He said something along the lines of, 
think about how big climate change is and then think about how many of us are, that just means that whatever you do is going to make a difference because everyone is needed. You don't have to be a scientist to do something about this. Like we need people in the arts. We need people who work in agriculture and various other sectors where society for us to be able to stop this thing, for us to be able to pull it off. And I think that is really what Octavia Butler was trying to get at here in Parable of the Sower. Thanks so much for tuning into our first episode of Stories for Earth, a podcast about stories that can give us strength and resiliency in fighting the climate crisis. Don't forget to visit our website at storiesforearth.com for transcripts and news about the show, in addition to recommendations for further reading and other resources. That's storiesforearth.com. If you feel so inclined, consider donating to one of the organizations listed on the donate page of our website. If you like what you hear so far, you can also support further production of this show through Patreon. Join us next time as we discuss the second book in the Parable series, Parable of the Talents by Octavia E. Butler. Until next time, I'm Forrest Brown, and thank you for listening to Stories for Earth.